So in this picture, there are three generations. My grandma, or my nanny, her daughter, who's my mother, and myself. And there's one thing that's very, very different about me uh, from the two of them, uh, and it's not my sense of style. Uh, I was told that during my time as a fetus, my heart didn't do the correct number of twists. And I ended up with a condition called transposition of the great arteries, which is exactly what it means. Uh, my great arteries, which are the pulmonary artery and the aorta, were swapped or transposed. Now in a normal heart, like probably most of you have, um, the pulmonary artery brings oxygen poor blood to the lungs where it gets oxygenated back to the heart and the aorta brings that oxygenated blood back to the body. When those two vessels are switched, you end up with two essentially independent loops. Um, which doesn't really matter as a fetus because you have oxygenated blood from your mother. You have an umbilical cord, that's what they're for. Uh, when you start using your lungs, this doesn't work out so well, right? That oxygenated blood is not getting to your body. So I was gonna have to have surgery the day I was born. And luckily, luckily for me, they figured this out when I was uh, about three months into my mom. Uh, and unfortunately for my parents, they had six months wondering if their firstborn child was going to survive surgery. They wanted to know, would I be normal? Would I be able to go to college? Would I be able to play sports? Would I be able to have children of my own someday? Back in 1986, they weren't really sure um, what was gonna happen to me. So, uh, I'm still here, so obviously things worked out okay. Um, as a kid, I was constantly reminded of my odd beginning in life. Every other year, I'd have a 24-hour halter or heart monitor put on me, and I'd have to keep a diary of what I'd done. Was I drinking, swimming, running, socializing, being teased? The doctors wanted to know, basically, what did life do to my heart? Um, and so this made me innately interested in science, especially biology. I wanted to know things like, how did a heart work? Why did I require antibiotics when I went to the dentist? And more importantly, why was I born with a congenital heart defect and my little brother wasn't? And so it's this last question uh, that really spurned this question of wanting to know where babies came from. And actually, when I was eight years old, uh, some kids on the playground had some questions about this. And I was like, ugh. At home, we got this great sex ed book. Lots of cartoons, no words, it's perfect. I'll bring it in. Naturally, uh, I got into a lot of trouble, <laughs> so I moved on with my questioning uh, in my early childhood to more important matters like, how do mermaids have sex? Because seriously, how do they do it? It's just, <laughs> never quite understood that. To um, the question I want to talk to you today about, which is, where do fish come from? So where do fish come from? Well, they come from the ocean, but fish come from other fish. Fish have to have sex or reproduce somehow to make more fish, right? That just seems like pretty logical. And at the very least, their sperm and eggs have to get together to do it uh, in the ocean. That's actually how a lot of marine animals do it. They release their sperm and egg into the water column where hopefully they'll meet and form new babies. And while we know this much about a lot of marine animals, there's still so much we don't know about their reproduction especially the seafood that we eat. So today, I wanna to talk to you about three very important uh, seafood items or animals that have been um, really important to the economies here in, in New England and actually Canada. So, and that includes the Atlantic cod, the American lobster, and the giant sea scallop. So first up, we have the Atlantic cod or Gaddis Morwa, which to me sounds like a villain from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> They're migratory fish that meet up in huge spawning aggregations of hundreds to thousands of individuals. Males and females pair off, sometimes another male comes along too, and release their egg and sperm in the same small area of water. Those eggs, if they get fertilized, then develop into larvae and then eventually into juveniles. And the juveniles that survive might only be 1% of all the eggs that were cast in that single spawn. Then they take anywhere from two to eight years to develop into sexually mature adults. Now, 
As cod get older, they get longer. And as they get longer, they get bigger. And what I mean by that is they have an exponential relationship with volume. And all that extra volume as an old long cod allows for a lot more eggs. So if you're old, you're probably big and you're able to reproduce even more than someone half your size as a fish. So another thing that's uh, to be said for being old is that you've actually survived this long, which means your offspring have a pretty good chance of surviving that long as well. Okay. So if you're a fisherman, how do you fish cod? Well, the problem with being a reliable spawner that goes back to the same area year after year at the same time is that it makes you a really easy target. And if you fish that area, that population, while they're spawning over and over again and hard enough, what happens? The fish disappear, right? You interrupt animals having sex, they don't even get a chance to make babies. And also, in addition to um, killing all the fish, we like to eat big fish, right? Historically, we have. If you take all those big fish, big old fish out of the population, you're selecting for smaller fish that are short-lived, and they're, they're living faster because they're dying faster because we're killing them. In the last century, our technology and commercial fisheries spread so rapidly and was so widespread and so accessible, we went farther and deeper into the ocean than we ever have before. Fish founders literally found fish. And in the 80s, there were huge peaks in cod and other ground fish stocks with hopes for the 90s. Really, this was just a reflection of how deep to the bottom of the barrel we'd gotten. And in 1992, the Federal Minister of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada declared a moratorium on the cod fishery. A 500-year-old fishery gone overnight. Thousands were unemployed. The moratorium still holds up to this day, the exception of a few places. And so in the meantime, uh, what have we done? We, have, we still have the moratorium. The US federal fishery declared closed areas on George's Bank, among other areas, but codfish populations barely have a pulse. Why is this? Well, it turns out that a lot of those populations, those spawning aggregations, were geographically extinct. And once you wiped those spawning aggregations out, they're never coming back. So the only areas that we have left of cod are closed areas, and they have a lot of small fish. And one paper that recently came out estimated that it takes up to 40 years to feel the effects of old fish, those benefits that I was talking about. So it's gonna take a while. All right, so let's move on to more happy animal. Um, the American lobster, or Homerus americanus, which to me sounds like Captain America's sidekick or pet. They're generally very grumpy animals, which I think most of you know that. Um, and they take about seven years to sexually mature. And when a female is ready to mate, she somehow bursts her way into a male's shelter and subdues him somehow. <laughs> she sheds her very hard exoskeleton re to uh, reveal her soft and vulnerable body. At this point, he may decide to eat her um, if he's not interested in sex. It's like the worst porno scene ever, right? <laughs> so if things go well, uh, he inserts sperm packets with his gonopods or modified appendages into her abdomen. She hardens up her exoskeleton and she is on her way. And she can hold on to that sperm for up to two years and fertilize anywhere between three and 75,000 eggs, depending on her size. After she fertilizes them, it takes about nine months for them to develop before she fans them out open to the, into the ocean, and they might take another month to settle into, um, into juveniles. Okay, so if you're a lobsterman and you ca catch a buried female lobster in your trap, what do you do? Well, back in 1917, for various political reasons, um, the V-notch, was introduced to the main lobster fishery. Um, so if a lobsterman comes across a buried female in his trap, he's required to put a V-notch in her tail. Like in this picture, you can see in the tail, there's a V there. Um, and this is a buried female. <laughs> you can see all the eggs there. And then throw her back. 
And so what this does is it protects the lobster babies from this year, but not just this year, because that V-notch lasts about two molts or two to three years. So it lasts for at least a couple more years for her to reproduce. Not only that, but it's a signal to the next harvester that catches her in his trap to put her back and that she's part of the reproductive stock. It is the only mechanism in the fishery that returns a legal sized lobster back to the wild. So while the V-notch has not explained the entire history of the lobster fishery in New England, the early recognition by fishery managers and lobstermen um, of conserving reproductive stock has created a culture that values it. And that is really, really critical. All right, animal number three, my favorite, the giant sea scallop, or Placopectin magellanicus, which to me sounds like an archipelago that the explorer Magellan named after himself. Um, these are bizarre animals. Aside from looking like an ocean floor burger, they have tens to hundreds of eyes that surround their mantle. We still don't know what they use them for. And one giant muscle that they use for swimming short distances, that's the only part that you eat, by the way. And then they have huge gonads that can reach up to 30 to 40% of their body weight at the peak spawning season. A female scallop can produce anywhere between one and three million eggs per spawning season, uh, depending on their size. So scallops sexually mature around four years, and it's estimated they usually have around 10 years. So that's six reproductive seasons. So six times three million, only 1% survive. That's about 180,000 scallops that an individual female could produce, if we're actually being pretty liberal, because 1% is kind of a lot for survivability. Okay, so they're broadcast spawners, much like cod. This is a picture of a scallop in the corner and a bunch of eggs. These are, they look like dust. They're about 70 microns in diameter, which is actually, for perspective, 70% the size of a human, a human egg, just to give you an idea of how small our eggs are. So they're broadcast spawners, and they tend to like to aggregate in groups on the sea floor. Sort of like cod, except cod do it in the water column. So uh, if you're a fisherman and you come across an aggregation, what are you gonna do? Well you know, you've hit the jackpot. You just get all of them at once. So if you fish hard enough and long enough and everywhere, what happens? Well, in the 1980s, this is a familiar story, we see a peak in catch and then a drop in landings. So in 1994, two years after Canada, the US federal fishery declared a closed area on George's bank. And after just four years, scallop population rebounded by 14-fold. It is an incredible recovery story in the history of fisheries. But no one knows exactly why or how, or if reproduction has anything to do with it. So in my lab, we wanted to know if aggregating or increasing your density, which is the same thing as closing the distance, uh, decreasing the distance between you and your nearest scallop, um, if that increased fertilization success or the percentage of eggs fertilized. It makes sense, right? If you're releasing sperm and egg into the water, you want to be kind of close, right? It applies to dating too, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. So one set of experiments showed that yes, in fact, increasing density really does increase fertilization success. But then another set of experiments we did showed there wasn't a significant difference between low and high density populations. But actually this last result isn't a bad thing. It means there's hope for recovery if you protect an area that's been overfished, like what we saw in George's Bank. But there's still so much we don't know. We've only done this study in one area in Maine. There's so many other places. Oceanography may play a role. We don't know enough about their larvae. We don't know very much about their juveniles. So today, I've given you a few snippets of information about reproductive um, biology. This is just the surface for three animals that have been so important to our economy. Lobster and scallops today, each industry brings in about $500 million a year to the Northeast. And while we know how to grow another chicken or a cow or a goat on land, we're still learning how to properly manage our fisheries and grow seafood in aquaculture settings. And we need to be careful. As a fisheries biologist, uh, Ransom A. Meyer said, who's now deceased, unfortunately, the more I think about it, 
the more I believe that we really don't know anything. So if you manipulate things and you don't know anything, you want to be really, really careful. This next photo shows me that we have not been careful enough. This is fish caught on a dock in Key West in the 50s, the 70s, and the early 2000s, which happened to coincide with the decades that my grandma was in her 20s, my mom was in her 20s, and I was in my 20s. And I don't think we've been careful enough, but I know we can do better. I know we can do better because we've developed the kind of technology that saved people like me from death at birth. If we have sustainable fisheries, if we have healthy ecosystems, then we can profit from them, and our children can profit from them, and our grandchildren can profit from them. So I leave you with this thought. As we continue to reproduce on this planet, we need to let our seafood reproduce too. Thank you. <laughs>